Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something deviant and brainwashing. say you don't know exactly what's going on right now, but we do know that there are some psyops going on, right? Ma'am, I don't know. Cinema psyops. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels. I know what it does to you. Cinema psyops. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. Welcome to episode 274 of Cinema PsyOps. I'm your host, Court, the guy that's so determined to blow the hell out of his voice every week right before he even starts the show, just to sound that much more excited and just a little less scared. But this week, joining me all the way across the city in his own little bunker recording studio is Matt. I literally thought a bomb was going to go off on that one. That was good. That was good. You held that one long. That was nice. I've been stretching my vocal cords just to see if I've still got Dude, it. That's like, that's really fucking good. <laughs> Thanks, man. I haven't even. Like, I haven't, really good. I haven't even gone to what I used to be able to pull off, dude. So. It's insane. You could have been a, like, a, a, a game show announcer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's um, somebody would have you give me a here's Johnny. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's me um, doing or, or using some of the vocal training that I had for singing. I joke about blowing out my voice, but I can actually do that without really hurting. And I just I've been going and trying to go about as long as it takes before it'll hurt. And that's why it's been getting progressively longer every week, because I've been trying to make it longer without hurting my vocal cords as like practice. <laughs> it's nerdy as I mean, fuck, but it's fun. It's somewhat like a muscle, right? And just working it out will will fucking do it well vocal cords you need to warm up and you need to do certain things with and you need to keep them limber just like anything else because yeah there's some musculature and things like that in there but you can also damage the tissue if you're not careful but all that really does is do the me 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 right and all that really does though is like usually lower your voice and then sometimes add like that that sound of like someone who smoked 50 cigars forever like what it does is it makes your voice sound (laughs) awesome like goro's voice el goro from top Oh, nice. rhythm. Yeah, it makes your voice sound like that when you damage your vocal cords because that's what he claims happened to his <laughs> is all the cigar smoke and stuff or something. I can't remember what he said. <laughs> Because I told him I would kill for his voice. He's like, oh, you don't have to do that. You just have to do... And he listed off this stuff that he did that damaged, apparently, his vocal cords and makes him sound like that, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. But I feel like he naturally has that that amazing fucking voice, and I'm always just going to yep. sound like the douchebag that I sound like. 
<laughs> yeah, you got a good voice. We well, both have good voices for this. <laughs> well, you Not definitely... good faces, but we definitely have good voices. <laughs> no, I think we have the exact kind of face you need for radio or podcasting. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, we love making that joke. God, we've been making that for seven fucking years now, it feels like. But it's only been six-ish. It's only been six Yeah. Um, but yeah. 2020 has yeah. been a goddamn decade, so. It, it really has, <laughs> but maybe we're... I, <sighs> Maybe we're starting to get some light at the end of the tunnel. I don't. I don't fucking know. Uh, I've. I had. I started the like. I finished out last week with like this high hopes and you know just basically like feeling like everything was good. But yeah. I'm. I'm at the point now where whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And at this point, there's going to be eyes watching everything everywhere. And we know that usually Trump's bullshit doesn't really hold up under actual fucking scrutiny. So no. you just have to kind of hope that this direction that they're taking, no matter how hard they push and no matter how much it might be a united front with the republicans that whoever actually did truly win the election will be president yes <laughs> in which i truly believe biden won the presidency so uh, yeah there you go despite what your crazy aunt may be sending you videos of and claiming that it's you know vote tampering and that they're literally doing this and they're literally doing that no you're watching people doing stuff and someone else is telling you that they're literally doing this that doesn't mean that that's what you're seeing what you're actually when seeing someone is somebody doing their job and then someone else claiming that it's something different when someone ends a uh- a, a post with the the word facts in all caps typically means what they got is nothing uh, that uh, it would be even resemble a fact. It's a preconceived notion, something taken out of context, or something, or just bullshit they pulled out of thin air. Whenever I see hashtag facts or just facts in all caps, or if your post is in all caps, yeah, I'm gonna probably think you're kind of full of shit. Unless you're a huge Deathgasm fan, yeah, then I think you're just screaming at me in, in fucking death metal. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> there's differences. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there's a little hope at the end of the tunnel here. We'll see what's going to happen. It's obviously still not over because apparently it's... this election is going to edge us far worse than any millennial ever could dream. <laughs> right. Well, this is all going to have to end up on the Psychosomatic Podcast. Oh. Let's bring it all back. <laughs> Uh, so this movie this week was another sort of blind buy. It was on sale, Mondo Macabro, and it was like a regular edition version of the film that we're talking about this week. And I just decided to pull the trigger based on the really awesome cover and the fact that it was named suddenly in the dark. Like what? What the, what the fuck is that even supposed to be? What's that all about? Yeah, what's going on here? And then later I found out, oh, it turns out that this film is actually like, you know, this really heralded foreign made film. So it's a South Korean made film from like 1981. And I don't know if there were horror films being made in South Korea before this or not. I'm going to have to find that out and see if I can do some more research here. And actually, can I say something? Because I I did do a little research on this because I like this movie so much. Okay, go ahead. They say this was made right at the time they started relaxing a lot of their censorship laws in South Korea. So it was kind of like one of the first made before the new millennia brought all these K horror film type films. This is one of the first ones ever get to get made in the eighties because they were relaxing those laws. Okay. So that's what I was suspecting that that might've been the case that this is a front runner of South Korean cinema, particularly of the more transgressive and trippy nature, because this feels very much uh, aesthetically in a lot of the changes and the warping of the image that goes on that will really kind of break down later on. But a lot of that kind of stuff is very heavily in Southern Korean filmmaking. Like, there's a lot of that kind of stuff in, oh God, is it Chan Woo Park, I believe is the gentleman's name. He's the guy who did the Vengeance trilogy, which was Old Boy, uh, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, and Sympathy for Lady Vengeance, but not released in that order. I think I actually, three, one, and one and two is what I listed off. Uh, <laughs> he also made... Uh, um, Thirst, I think is what it's called. It's like a really interesting vampire movie uh, as well. And just some really incredible stuff. Chan Wu Park. So that film is extremely like his his films are extremely transgressive and do these very interesting visual flares and like all of the stuff that I'm I'm used to seeing in that turn of the century cinema that you brought up is so prevalent in this film, but done with what they had at the time to be able to create some of those crazy visuals um, that they didn't have, like the, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about now they're they're using the CG at the turn of millennium and you know various other techniques that we have been able to develop but mostly what they had to 
be able to do these kind of tricks were just what can we do to distort the image with the lens and let's see what works and there's some stuff that i'm suspecting that they did like again we'll get into it when we get there but i really kind of applaud the ingenuity to get the type of look that they were able to achieve with some of these things and when i do describe what i think they used i don't want to make it sound like i am disparaging it because the end result did impress me when we talk about those shots <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> I, I get what they were trying to do and I'm really kind of behind it and I'm chomping at the bit to really to kind of talk about this film uh, yeah let's do it yeah there's no trailer uh, no trailer and there'll be no clips this is classic style because everything was in subtitles right and unfortunately there was no soundtrack included with the film this time I've been spoiled <laughs> but um, I did grab some music that sort of fits with the, the 80s uh, synthesized uh, style score and everything although this film had a very very unique and different kind of feel to it score than maybe what these songs are. It just fits in with the time frame is the best I can do. Because <laughs> I've... Hey, sometimes that's all you can do. Yeah, Suddenly in the Dark is definitely uncategorizable with a lot of what you're doing other than, yes, it is a horror film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But, but there's a lot of stuff where I just can't find music befitting of because I just don't know if anything will ever befit this film again. <laughs> it might not. I mean, this is just a, this is really a trippy movie. Yeah, but we've beaten around the bush and now I was complaining yeah. about edging earlier and now everyone else is uh, yeah, <laughs> wanting us to stop. Everyone all edged out. <laughs> they want us to stop edging them as well. So we'll take yeah. the break. We will play the Legion GoFundMe promo. We'll have a little bit of music when we come back. We will review Suddenly in the Dark. This is Bo from LegionPodcasts.com. Hey, it's been a crazy time, and when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old-fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand-scale take-a-penny-leave-a-penny. For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar. For those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on, well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com, on our Facebook group page, or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon. Well, with the prevalence of Stranger Things and all of the other 80s-based stuff, we have a plethora of 80s-based synthwave and retrowave that has just cropped up everywhere. And I am fishing through the best of the best of the royalty-free for you folks for this show. Mm, listen to you all fancy the plethora. <laughs> I could always mispronounce it like that dude in the uh, Trekkies film where he says the plethora. <laughs> you always just mispronounce it like I always do, so I won't feel so fucking alone. <laughs> uh, the only way you're going to feel less alone is to do the review. Oh, shit. Hurtful. All right, suddenly dark. The first 20 minutes, we open up with a guy. He's uh, in a cave. He's kind of exploring. And all these bats fly around is what I think think is bats at first. And that leads us into like a title sequence. I, I, I'm going to tell you, I have no idea what that was all about. Because uh, uh, that's maybe one of my first things is, it's, until you know, it's introducing us to the main male character. But it was just, it was a really weird way to do it. I think he may or may not have have discovered possibly that statue in a cave and when he took a photo of it and brought it out yes. into the real world this is what causes the story to happen and i think that's what they were showing us but we weren't actually seeing everything yeah, because of the weird kaleidoscope and the flashing perspective and all of that i think that's what they were doing yeah i think so okay i think you're exactly right thank you well <laughs> for the assistance okay there's a lot of stuff that this movie shows you visually that may not necessarily be what's happening in the story, but there's a whole other sub level to the film's 
plot line that makes you think that it may be more spiritual in nature than what it was. But like the way that the film is actually presented, there's two questions the film keeps asking. And every conversation is always about these two questions. Is this really happening or is the female protagonist slowly losing her mind? And I feel like they couldn't be more obvious as to what was happening in the cave. It just in retrospect seems to me to be that this is how everything got started. And this is where that photo of the statue was taken, was in this cave. And then that's what unwinds the rest of everything, which could possibly answer one of the those two questions you get what i'm saying that's why i don't want to go any further than that yeah i agree don't let's uh let's just calm it down right (laughs) i thought way too fucking much about this movie when i should have been sleeping last night matt (laughs) i i mean i do not blame you this this movie had me wondering like a lot of shit yeah it was very thought-provoking and i mean that very sincerely yes um uh, so anyway he comes this man comes home uh to his family and we understand he studies butterflies for the local university yeah so maybe they weren't yeah. bats maybe they were just like this very I rare think breed a butterfly that he was trying to snap photos of yeah but they made it yeah. feel like bats because it was coming out of the dark and all this other stuff in this cave because it was a, it, yeah it was in a cave but yeah i think it was actually butterflies so he um As he somewhat just, uh, you know, he's kind of at home getting, you know, getting rested and all that. And his wife is telling him, you know, that university called and wants him to do more lectures. And he's just fucking almost tired of it. But fuck, yeah, you know, he'll have people come over. And uh, so um, anyway, so he decides to lecture that night. And then he and his wife, it appears, are that they start getting down. So good good for them. Seems like he's been away for a while. Why why wouldn't they get down? They're a married couple. If. 1981 is the first time that they loosen some of the censorship laws and allow filmmakers to express as they want to express. Do you feel that this film made the sexual components that it filmed more artistic and tried to give it merit so that they wouldn't fuck it up for the people to come after them? I think so. And I think they made it a very important part of the story because it it does become very important. Yeah. The sexual intimacy and the touching and also and, this is a husband and wife yeah and the so right and the texture of it all and and you know just yeah. the way that everything's going and also the way that they film it if you notice the older actress that is the wife in this um is not as naked as someone who is younger because apparently it's more artistic for the fresh 20 something to be naked more than an actress who would be let's just and say think, upper 30s possibly can can i also say part of that goes I think to the story I get another reason I really like this and I will get to that right okay but it's another reason I love this movie right the thing that I think the reason that they did it that way is so that they could be salacious and could sell because they have a hot naked younger woman there you yeah. know uh, but at the same time they integrated it into the story in such a way that it could be argued that it is for artistic merit which makes this the sleaziest thought provoking film I've seen in a long time and I like that again I stayed up way too late thinking about this fucking movie after I watched yeah, it. So did I. So did I. I really did. I laid there looking up at the ceiling thinking about this fucking movie. It's it's just all right. Anyway, <laughs> let's let's get back to it here. I'm just glad um, we're in sync on this. So yeah. We can sit here and agree over and over again about how great every single individual thing is, or maybe we can stick to the formula and maybe pull off a shorter review this week. Yeah, right. Um so anyway, uh he meets with his colleagues and they're checking out all these butterflies on a slideshow it's like just think of like if you ever got roped into seeing your aunt and uncle's fucking vegas vacation and slideshows it's fucking horrible only for science which makes it slightly worse yeah yeah it's 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 just everything's just terrible um (laughs) even the wife is just like trying to leave the room but then again so interested in what's going on yes well anyway then when the slides lands on that wooden figure doll the wife is is it seems very bothered by this doll. Um, just right off the bat, she seems like this is not something she's into. This is not something she uh, wants any part of. She's very scared of it. Does it trigger emotional response, or is it triggering some kind of spiritual, physiological shudder of fear? That's the to question. Me, yeah, that's the question. To me, right there, I think it's just basic 
emotional fear. She just doesn't like the look of it. Um, as far as far as I can tell, this also may be a cultural difference for us. Maybe it represents some type of known goddess quantity that she's already aware of, and then knowing what that statue is is what is terrifying her, and we don't know until we're told later. So that could be just our interpretation. Yeah, no that that is very true. That might not be you know, what we're exactly thinking of here. So anyway, uh, as they're talking about it, uh, he has no idea where it came from. Uh, One of his colleagues says that uh, it's a witch. And he's like, well, I didn't realize you studied shamans. And he goes, I don't. It's just very prevalent right now in the area. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, You know, they're all kind of giving their colleague who knew what it was shit for it. You know, like, yeah, okay. Why do you, you know, why do you know all about this and all that kind of shit? So uh, they, uh, as they talk, they uh, discover that... Um, He's just like, you know, I think it's just something got lost in there. It's no big deal. But they also say that a lot of people view these as protection. Like, uh, these these dolls provide protection to the people who hold them. So then they go back and then they start looking at other uh, uh, butterflies. Uh, the next one is kind of like almost in its, in its instinct butterfly. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah, they're talking what? about how rare they are, but they still kind of exist. And yeah. they, unfortunately... The- like, like, they talk about colleagues who would catch one, but they would always die and travel back to study them. Right. And they're not able to preserve the bodies because they, they need to at least preserve the bodies. Um, but they, they, they those specimens of the preserved ones where they tack them on the wall to show the markings and everything, but they're preserved. Like yeah. something happened to the ones that existed on that. So they don't even have them. So bringing back a dead one wouldn't be such a bad thing, but they would really like to be able to transport them alive. A long conversation about this. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, so much so, I really noted it down um, again, but nothing comes of that. Maybe one of my few, if any, critiques of this movie is they spend a lot of time on some stuff that they probably didn't need to. Well, it's probably virgining filmmakers that you know are trying something that they may not have done before, or maybe it's just a style of storytelling that culturally is different than ours that we're just not used to it. Because there's been plenty of times that I felt not necessarily that it was not needed, for this kind of stuff it was like this is their idea of character development and what is a man if he's not his job so let's see him doing his job that's true all right there you go that's um that's actually a really uh intelligent way to look at it i fucking told oh. you i was up all night thinking about this yeah no i mean that's that was great thank you um uh I mean, it just, it helps me explain some things. So, um, his wife goes downstairs and she hears noises and she sees the doll in the window. Um, and, uh, then another female friend comes in and nothing's there. And she talks about how the guys want some coffee and stuff. Well, we cut to more husband and wife boning. And in the afterglow, she brings up the doll. She says she feels it's a bad omen. He says, um, that, you know, she's kind of just being silly that not to worry about it. And, uh, that uh, they'll be fine, you know, just you're being, you know, way too paranoid. You know, bad omens there. Always listen to your wife on occasion. I'm just saying, you know, it might help you out. Then he says he has to leave again for another few days to go capture another butterfly that they really want to get. I believe he's talking about the one that um, that he and his colleagues were talking about. You know, the one they all really want to get. So he has to be gone for a while. So uh, the wife then goes the next day, kind of goes to visit a friend, and the friend starts filling her with all these kind of ideas that, you know, he's probably cheating on you. That's why he's gone so much. She goes, no man should want to be gone this long from his house, no matter how much he likes butterflies, she says, completely ignoring the fact that it's his career and his job. I got nothing to add. This is all just boilerplate making characters happen stuff, so. Yeah. Um, So, but it's getting into the wife's head, thinking about it. The husband then comes home from this trip with a younger woman in the car. Her name is uh, Miyoki, and he found her out wandering around alone. Her parents are apparently dead, and the villager says she works hard, and they could be their new housemaid. This makes the wife very happy. Apparently, she had been looking for a housemaid for a while. I feel like this is also a cultural thing where it's like she's got no one to take care of her. Let's give her a chance to earn her keep in our household. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it feels, exactly, it, it feels like it would be less bizarre in 1981 in Korea for this to happen. But for me, there's like all sorts of warning signs. I'm like, no, don't you fucking do that. Cause I've seen tons of horror movies. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> you don't just pick some stranger up off the road and say, hey, come live with me and clean up my stuff and prepare my food. Like, it just doesn't it was, seem right to me. Yeah, it was a different time. <laughs> is it or is it just like it's a different like a cultural thing? You know, it that, could be. Yet. Like, yeah, I just I'm speculating and I'm asking the questions because I just didn't know. But this was the first thing in the movie where I'm like, what the f- why are they agreeing? To the- what? Why? Yeah. I and was, the wife is like super excited about it, too. Well, like it, it's like a is it a status thing? Would you think that they can also well, afford and then also she yeah. she can um enjoy a more life of leisure and be a more kept woman and she can feel like like he genuinely loves her so much that she just he wants her to not have to be burdened by the day-to-day prepping of the housework and just to be you know a kept woman like i, I feel like that's yeah. what like well, she's happy about that right not only that but it could be they're supposed to be very yeah very wealthy what if like that's a lot of house for one person to take care of you know especially when you already have a child as well well yeah so, that's another thing too the house while they may not be really well off they have an extremely large house that would be extremely difficult for one person to maintain and do all the cooking for the family if that's what she's and, expected. So and and raise a young daughter and raise a young daughter who really doesn't do much bad at all and is probably the nicest and sweetest character in the entire film. Agreed. That, that's a that seems like a really nice kid. Yeah, <laughs> I was like maybe if you could have a kid like her, kids wouldn't be so bad. Yeah, right. And then I'm like, maybe. no, no, you're you're full of shit, Court. That's not. Let's not go down that road. Let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late now anyway, so let's just move on. So then the wife actually enters uh, Miyoki's, uh, Miyoki's room and uh, finds out, like, you know, well, they, they show her to her room and stuff like that. And um, then as the wife tells her to get settled, she goes back into her room and sees that she's just kind of still standing there. And she's like, oh, I thought you were going to change. And we find out she has no other clothes except for the clothes on her back. So her wife says she'll give her some. And she's about to take the uh, other, uh, the, the her little, like, she's carrying parcel. something wrapped in a towel, a uh, parcel. And she really freaks out about this. And she's like, don't worry, that's that's fine. I won't I won't take that from you. But you can't take and, it into the bath with you. This is the one thing I'm going to be firm on. <laughs> yeah. So they she puts it up on, like, a counter. And then she takes her to the bathroom. And then she bathes her. And then showers her and throughout the whole thing commenting about how young her skin is how young she is how beautiful she is how great her skin is i mean this is really inappropriate right (laughs) um i believe the words you're looking for are highly erotic matt okay well that i guess too i'm just saying i just did you know just saying she asked her her age and she's like oh i'm 19 and This, this particular scene whenever it happens in the film matt is when my butt cheeks unclench i sit back and breathe a sigh of relief and go oh there's the sleaze i need (laughs) <laughs> this is where I, st- I calm down when I'm like, okay, it's not going to be all art film all the time. I'm going to have a little sleaze at least. You know, like, courts can have a little sleaze in their movies as a treat. Right, yeah. There you go. Court can have some some sleaze in his life. <laughs> I can have sleaze. You can have sleaze. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, at dinner, the husband, he does say she's a beautiful girl. He goes, oh, I almost didn't recognize you because now she's not dirty anymore and she's in nicer clothes and she's clean. And he goes, oh, I didn't recognize her. And then he's like, you know, if she she really works out she should stay here until she gets married you know until you know she becomes someone else's problem and the wife was really happy about this uh she's she's right as as of night right now full on to everything um then the wife has flashes of her friend talking about younger women and and then she has flashes of the girl in the shower and all, all this shit so she kind of starts thinking about what her all the shit her friend was saying which you know can kind of be you know it's apparently fucking her up <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is this is kind of the, the beginning of some horseshit here. This is essentially the sequence where she spent all this time bathing the girl and just being so kind to her and just being so happy to have this extra help around the house. And, you know, they're also doing this sort of, um, I, I don't know how else to put it, but also like this charity type thing or, you know, this good work where they're offering a person a leg up because she now has a place that she can stay until she either gets married or decides that she's well off enough to leave and they're taking care of room and board and she will probably also earn a wage doing this so of course she'll be stoked about that but they're also being super kind like how they're bathing her and everything and taking care of her because at the same time she's this sort of not right in the head girl the way that they're portraying her and it's just 
it seems like yeah. she's like she's almost mute or something, and then she doesn't really communicate. She doesn't really understand things very well, and she's very shy and backward and kind of awkward. But at first, I thought she was just nervous or just like overwhelmed. But like more as the movie goes on, even in the dinner, well, like after she's cleaned up and they're trying so hard to make her comfortable, she doesn't even really respond or say things. She just smiles, and it's just awkward and weird. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, she is she is a very awkward young lady. Um, and we're going to find out kind of why she might be a little awkward. Right. Well, um, we're getting there. I just, I needed to point yeah. out that like during your entire description of everything that was happening where they bring her to the house, that was something that we needed to discuss and talk about because she has been acting very bizarre and in the parcel aside she's also very reserved and standing back out of the way and just like, you know, she gets a little excited here and there, but like her responses to everything seem really out of proportion. They're either too big or way too small or just grabbing onto something and standing in a corner for a while like she's not acting right and you shouldn't let her in your house yeah exactly so then that night uh the couple can they're discussing the girl the husband says that her mom was actually a shaman and she died in a fire and he found her wandering around the burnt husk of what was their church um the wife again starts bringing up her beauty but The husband doesn't really seem to care. He's like, oh, okay, I I guess if you think so. He almost seems a little off-put by how much his wife is talking about this uh, young girl's looks. Her husband seems kind of asexual at first, where she's the one that's always making overtures to get things going on between them. She's the one that's expressing desire. But not at the beginning of the film. (laughs) In the film, he took her. But she also there was a dialogue before that where she was disappointed that she had to wait until after the presentation. Did you not pick up on that? No, I did. Okay. So this is also, again, his career. Right. And how he provides this nice home. But like his first thought was, I got to do all this stuff for science, not I got to take care of my wife now that I'm home and the science can wait. Like he basically. That could be very true. Yeah. So I feel like whenever they are having sex, she's the one that's initiating it in some way. Even if he comes after her, she's basically telling him, you know, she's disappointed or whatever. Like they're clearly at this point, a very loving couple. But what I'm getting at is the husband is not an oversexual person. And he so does far not make yeah. any sort of direct, like he's not acting any sort of way inappropriate with this young lady. No, at, at first all. I thought the wife was going to start doing some stuff and we were going to have this like lesbian you, couple runaway film. Yeah. Like, or if something. you watch it, that's what it seems like because she's constantly talking about it. Right. So the film sets up or puts about this idea in your head of what may or may not be happening. And I will explain later on that I feel like maybe this is still happening but the conversation that we're having here is this statue once it comes about is everything that's happening really happening or is this all in this wife's head who is the main protagonist female that we're following Mm -hmm. those are the two questions that we're asking and this is the first time that we really start to ask the questions is this really happening or is this all in the wife's head and you wonder if maybe even that's part that you could expand that to the bathing like did that even happen or is that all in the wife's head yeah oh Oh my god it's fucking because difficult <laughs> because because different cultures aside it feels very suspicious to me that she is really quite attracted to this young girl and it's very inappropriate the way that she's bathing her and talking to her during that all cultural differences aside this seems like even someone who is more of a um liberal sensibilities when it comes to you know bathing each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> maybe maybe I'm repressed here, but like I still feel like she said and did some things that were inappropriate on top of if you're cool with people bathing each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm getting at here. So like, at what point is what starts happening real? Is this girl even in the house or is this also in the wife's head? I think the girl's in the house, but okay. it's a good mind's eye of what's real after this. Okay. So is this the, the bathing and the and coming in the house and the way, warm this welcome? Ends that's all that real? 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Th- yeah. This is all real then up to this point. You think this is all really happening so far? Yes. Okay. And- so far, I think all of this has happened. All right. And then the fixation, do you think the wife is, she doesn't suspect anything at first. She's just so excited and so happy and wants to give this girl a shower with compliments and make her welcome and feel at home because things are so fucking awkward. Yeah. Because it's really Uh, happening. I think for her, we can question if things are actually happening after that dinner when she started hearing her friend's voice talking about how, 
older women and younger women. Okay. Then it snaps into her head. Okay, so and I think from there on out, we can start questioning a lot of things. Okay, so the demarcation point for you is when we have a visual confirmation of some type of hallucination that no one else is aware of, of this audio and the flashing and all the weird visions that she's having at this point is the demarcation. Correct. So at dinner is when we need to start questioning the reality. Prior to dinner, we're pretty sure that might have all been real. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, yes. I, 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 that's a good point where, like, my thought is it could be further back, but, uh, I feel that this is a justifiable point to where no one else should argue that we can't start questioning reality here because that trippy shit got really fucking weird. And it got real fucking trippy. I feel like they put a, uh, drinking glass or a bowl of some sort on the end of the lens for some of these distorted shots and what they did they is they definitely did they moved it around until they could reveal a certain thing like so they could focus in the light into a certain way where they were like I want you to actually see this so they held the bottom of the glass or the bowl in such a way that it wasn't refracting the light and you could see an image but then they would just twist it ever so slightly so what they're able to do is just move the camera around and show you a bunch of different images with this cup like while they're perusing around and it feels almost like someone who's not necessarily going blind with rage but like they're losing their perspective on reality so much and things are just drifting away so much that it just feels like everything's washing over them and they have brief moments that they can focus in on you know yeah <laughs> and like no, a, i totally get it yeah and i really like the way that they're doing it and it's it's just this simple inexpensive little cheat that they can use but they use it so masterfully that it doesn't feel like like when you see something like Roger Corman would do where it was just a neat effect that he could throw in there and he wanted to try it and maybe spice up his movie you know like they're yeah. very specifically trying to focus your attention on certain images to drive the plot along while they're doing it and then when they mix it in with the hallucinatory audio that fucks with your head and then for like the rest of the dinner there's like an echo for no reason on everybody's vocals like there's very serious audio audio hallucinations and visual hallucinations that they're hinting at here. Am I wrong? No, not at all. And I think, it, it, especially after she she gets that friend's voice in her head, that what the conversation they had heard earlier, that's what begins all of this. That's the first time she has stuff like that. It's the first time we are witness well, to her having. Hold on, it. how about this? How about this? That's so wrong. First time we have any sort of psychotic vision or some kind of strange vision, it's after she sees the doll. Okay, so all the stuff that happens after the doll. Is it real Maybe, then? Maybe, but I don't think so. I think it's real, but the doll's the beginning. There's there's real stuff mixed in with fake stuff after the doll. Right. Well, I feel- And it gets progressively worse. I feel like the main character of the film, I feel as though she has some type of schizophrenia or something where she is losing moments in touch with reality. I, I feel like that's what's happening because she saw the doll and that's just the first one that we were sort of prey, like we were witness to, but then everybody else started joking around and it kind of snapped her out of it and she wasn't that focused on the doll once it was gone and she was able to kind of shake it off and you know everything's fine but then the girl comes to the house and the other fear that she was sort of told to have was that her husband might be having a wondering eye because of all the time he spends away from home and that was like her friend kind of put that in her head but not really to the point where she was taking it all that serious and then the girl shows up at the house and she's all excited she has this new helper around the house and they're doing this good work by allowing someone less fortunate them to have a home and you know get a leg up that kind of thing she's feeling great about that she's super polite super caring super accepting to the point where she showers the woman both with water and compliments then points out to the husband how beautiful she is now dressed in the clothes of his current wife symbolizing a person that could easily replace his wife as a newer model yeah yeah that's that's wow that's that's horribly accurate but yeah <laughs> then presents him her at dinner and points it all out that this is the case this is not behavior that you would expect someone to normally do but then again is this just her perspective on what is happening when this girl comes to the house to be a live-in maid or are things starting to just get that odd you know like who who knows but it it warrants this great discussion and you keep rolling it back and forth inside your head until you don't sleep the night before and you look kind of like Charlie Day uh, talking about Pepe Silva. <laughs> this film did that to me. Is that, is that what happened to you? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> 
Um, all right, so the next 20 minutes begins then. The wife hears her daughter and Miyoki arguing over Miyoki's parcel. After unwrapping the parcel, she finds that it's actually the doll from the slides she saw. Uh, she, uh, Miyoki says her mom blessed it for her. And in a flashback, she sees she's blessing it while the building's on fire. While it's actually, everything's kind of getting lit up. And she, uh, Miyoki says her mom blessed her for it and said it would protect her. And we kind of see all this fire and everything uh, in another strange vision. Um, later on, uh, she goes, the wife goes and checks the slides and the slide with the doll is now gone. She then overhears the girl talking to the doll in her room about how this is such a big house and these people are really nice and great and they'll stay there till they die. So that's kind of, you know, fucking awkward. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you don't you don't really go around and hear people like talking about like uh fucking hey let's all just fucking sit around till we're all fucking dead. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm being a little lenient, and it's like I'm I'm trying to throw up. Maybe it's just a cultural difference thing, but maybe what she's saying is she's so happy to be there that she would like to stay here for the rest of her life. But the translation doesn't work quite that way. I mean, you're, you might be right, but it just, it's, it's just, it's, it, it seems off to me. Right. Well, <laughs> that's, I, that's how I took it. But now having said that, the way that the wife reacts, I just took it as, well, now she knows for sure that this younger, hotter version of her is in the house and willing to stay for the rest of her life. Oh, shit. Yeah. Right. We're, we're, we, we this could get pretty fucked. Yeah. So either interpretation, depending upon whatever cultural bias or whatever it was actually supposed to meant by what she said, either way is not good and still kind of, Oh shit for the wife yeah. at this point. Yeah, like uh this isn't this isn't all that cool. Uh <laughs> Right. What what what's up with that? Anyway, um then the wife asked the husband about the slide and he said he had just gotten rid of it. He threw it away cuz it wasn't supposed to be in there. She tells him about the doll that Miyoki has being the same and he thinks that is weird, but it's not really a big deal. Those dolls are around everywhere which is true i guess they're all you know they're kind of all over the place yeah they're more common so that's why i was thinking maybe she actually had seen the doll before and knew what it was but yeah then it had some other kind of meaning to her other than being that but they're like these little safety totems where as long as you keep this with you 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 know and, and watching you then you'll be safe so it's kind of like having belief in a cross right that's what it would be or a totem like a, a jade buddha perhaps or you know like rambo had you know something like that yeah. where it's just a little something that's supposed to be like a symbol of protection you know i got gotcha. you yeah exactly but this is a larger statue because the burden of your protection requires it <laughs> yes exactly yeah there you go um uh so anyway um that night the husband is having to work late on his thesis so the wife goes to bed and she dreams that the husband and the girl are uh having some sexy sex and once again this is that weird kind of kaleidoscope vision which would almost ruin it but at the same time when they started doing the focusing thing they're focusing in on parts with the weird kaleidovision and then all of the pieces end up becoming that thing that they're focusing on before it changes to the next round of stuff and just like solid colors. So it gets this weird trippy thing where you don't really know what you're seeing, but at the same time, you can totally see what you're seeing. And yeah. they're giving you these really sexual overtures where like there's open nipples and some various uh, tweaking of them <laughs> that I was shocked was on the screen. Uh, yeah, right? You're like, holy cow, what a... Yeah. What are they all doing around here? They're letting it go with the whole code of ethics and uh, censorship shit now because, well, it's art. And I think that's why they overly kaleidoscoped it is to make it more feel like, you know, an actual artistic choice, not just throwing some sleaze in there to help sell the flick. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, listen, it, it sold the flick to me. Uh <laughs> Either way, I'm happy. You can call it art. Yeah, it's got my yeah. sleaze. Yeah, right. Um. So that she uh, wakes up and she hears moans uh, coming from Miyoki's room. She checks her husband's office and he's not there. So she goes to listen at the door and her husband scares her from right behind her. And he said he, he had gone out, he wanted to get some fresh air and he'd gone out for a walk. And he tells her to go to bed because she's looking very tired. She then stares kind of at the girl sleeping uh, in her room, and then she goes and she sits up all night. The husband and the daughter, and their daughter, they're leaving for the day, and the wife has been up all night, and she's like, she's had a headache, and Miyoki's outside, says goodbye to everybody, and she kind of snaps at Miyoki and tells her to get to cleaning. Um, 
at the store, the wife is shopping and she's all fucked up. I mean, she can't really see well, uh, whether her vision's like blurry or masked or that whole kaleidoscope shit. It's 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 not doing she's not she's not doing very well right now. Yeah, it jumps between all of those and her reality is getting fragmented and then blurry and then just weird. And it's supposed to be, I'm guessing, things that are happening when she's getting these headaches, because I don't know if you've ever had that, but I've had really bad like headaches before where it blurred my vision. And then also I did see that sort of kaleidoscopy, like wavy crystal thing before from a headache pressure around my, my eyes. So, Oh really? I've never had a headache that bad. Yeah. Oh yeah. I felt like my eyes were going to pop out of my fucking head, like, like really bad headaches, like sinus headaches that are that bad. Uh, But you do see things like that. So I wonder if it's supposed to be, I, I was thinking that they were hinting that she has a brain tumor or something else wrong with her mind. That's causing this tremendous amount of headaches and pain. Yes. So then, um, here, uh, so at the store, even the register lady tells her that she looks very, very tired. Uh, so then the wife gets uh, home and she sees the husband's car there and he is at home. Uh, she, at first when she walks in, thinks she sees Miyoki like straddling the husband in the kitchen at the table, but then just sees just the husband sitting there. Uh, she asks what he's doing home and he says there was a sporting event and classes were canceled. Then Miyoki comes in and she yells at her for dressing like a slut and the, uh, in her outfit there. And uh, the husband tells her to calm down. She gave her that outfit. He's like, you gave her this outfit. And she's like, well, there's a certain way you can wear it. So this is already starting to sound really kind of, the, the wife's starting to sound really bad here. <laughs> well, she's a bit jealous, but she also has a point. You could see the lady's breasts underneath the shirt. She does point that out. And she All felt right, that well. might have been appropriate with her child around, possibly. But later on, she's still wearing the shirt again. But then she has an undershirt or a bra under it and they're covered. But in that particular scene, I saw everything. I saw everything. Then the husband even tells her that she is very smart. He asked her to go grab some samples, and she knew the differences between two butterflies that even some of his colleagues can never know. She asked how that could be, and he said, I don't know, she must have seen it by, you know, uh, through, like, by watching me work. Which, again... I learned it by watching you! Yeah, it makes the wife go a little... You could tell even the panic in her eyes when he said things like that, meaning they spend time together. And then also, she's even more easily replaced because not only can this girl cook and clean the house, she can also assist the professor in his work, which the wife is incapable of doing. Yeah, right. Um, so, um, then the, uh, wife, she checks Miyoki's room and finds the husband's lighter in there. She starts yelling at Miyoki, asking her where she got it. Then the husband walks in and says that that lighter was broken. He threw it away. He, like, threw it on the ground and Miyoki must have picked it up. And Miyoki agreed, states that, yes, that's exactly what she did. She, she picked it up. And that, uh, that's the end of that 20 minutes. So we're starting to see the wife kind of break down now. The whole thing that we're doing here, part of question one and question two with all of the dialogue and everything that's being discussed and all the arguments that are happening, you know, is this all really happening or is this all in her mind? Part of that, is this all really happening is, is someone trying to gaslight her or is this all truly in her mind? So again, is it all yeah. real and someone's trying to convince her she's crazy or is it all in her mind and she truly is crazy which i'm also lumping in if it's supernatural that means it's all in her mind and she's crazy because you know supernatural <laughs> supernatural and I'm, I'm skeptic so you know that's where i'm gonna put that one but you know is it all in her head or is this all really happening and so far she's seeing things that it really feels like they're not really there and she's making stuff up and she's convinced that her husband is cheating on her but she hasn't actually physically seen it herself all she's done is woken up in bed and been upset yes and this is this is all very very true but so that means you know there's uh there's a lot of stuff that's uh m- needs to happen here and uh you, you you can tell there's she she's she's going away she's she's further and further and becoming more and more manic and in the pain in her head is becoming far far worse which makes me think that maybe this isn't all really happening because perhaps she has a tumor so like that's it. like is it really happening because maybe she has a tumor there's all these different red herring things that the movie's throwing at you where it's like well it could be this or it could be that what's going on with her and you never get an easy answer 
out. It's all these things that make you try to ascertain from what they're showing you. Is this really happening? Is this possibly a brain tumor? Is that what the headaches are all about? You know, or is it, uh, you know, an outside supernatural force that's trying to possess her, which means, again, it's all in her head. (laughs) Or is it an external supernatural force that's doing all of this stuff? And, you know, she's fucking really living through this nightmare as we're seeing it. What's going on here? You know, or is she just so worried she's literally worrying herself sick? Yeah, all that kind of shit. And you're just loaf, man. In, and I can't in, find a position that I can really take on what I feel or I think because it leaves everything so up into tr- interpretation, even to the very end of the film, that I just don't even know. <laughs> yeah, it's so fucked up, man. I mean, these movies always kind of get to me because I'm always sitting there like, F- I mean, f- what's real? What's not? Shit. Fuck. Yeah, I mean, that works on me much better than just explaining it all. If you give me a lot of different possibilities, but at the same time, keep twisting all of those threads, which they do until the very end, they weave them all together and they start braiding them all together towards the end of the story to where you really don't know. It could be all of the above. (laughs) Yeah, right. As to whether or not this is in her head or or not, but you still don't even know, is it in her head or is it really happening? No matter what the other questions that you start asking yourself about what you're seeing, which is so well done. And I am so happy I own this film. (laughs) Right. So then uh, starting the next 20 minutes, the wife is still having trouble sleeping. Um, She's she's having visions of all the stuff and uh, that she's seen. And, and all these kind of past visions and, and all this other, uh, you know, horrible, horrible stuff. So we see uh, Miyoki is showering. And the wife goes to Miyoki's uh, room and she's kind of drawn to the doll. She keeps walking up and then the door swings open and it looks like the doll is standing there. But it's actually Miyoki who tells her and she's like, why Why did you open the door so loud? She goes, I didn't even know I, I actually or, you know, opened anything too loudly. I'm sorry. And she goes, well, just go and get to cleaning. She tells her to go to clean. The wife and the friend are talking. The friend is now trying to calm down the wife. She's like, you know, you really need to stop. None of this is making any sense. He wouldn't try to, uh, you know, he's he's not, your husband is not going, he'll cheat maybe on you away from home. He's not going to move her in and cheat on you. He's like, he's not the type. And you sit there and you go, well, okay, so now she's trying to be, you know, the uh, uh, someone who makes some sort of sense. And uh, you would have to have a giant set of steel fucking balls to move your mistress in to the house yeah. under the guise of someone you just so happened to find on the road. You would have to have a massive set. Yeah, that a is massive set fat. of solid steel balls to try and yeah. pull that kind of stuff off. Or you're just a narcissistic douche. Yeah. Or maybe a little bit of both. This strike us as any like that no you know no not not at all so it's a question of well is something sort of happening or is this all in her head again yeah (laughs) and you hope and you, you you pretty much see yeah this is all in just in her head there's no way it's not well and even her friend who is super paranoid about having herself be upgraded to a younger hotter model is like yeah maybe if he was actually you know if, if you found him outside in the outside world near her possibly but no husband's gonna do that and bring it home yeah like that part of it is what she feels is outrageous which should reassure our heroine of this story but doesn't yeah no it, it really doesn't it hurt now her friend is trying to talk sense into her and telling her hey listen you know none of this is going on almost like maybe she realized well i really pumped her full you know and 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 can cause a problem there yeah he she wound her up and now this is all her fault yeah exactly um so then uh she also then suggests maybe she should see a doctor like a, a psychologist to maybe get these kind of feelings checked out to which the wife of course scoffs at because you know i guess there's a stigma you you know and this is the 80s in another country say i mean stigmas are tough to beat or perhaps she knows she really does need it and is just in serious denial and getting angry every time somebody suggests it yeah exactly so that night the wife hears uh this creaking and she's trying to sleep and you see her ear move that camera work on this was really cool when you could hear creaking while she's trying to sleep and you saw her ear actually moving as she's trying to listen 
Uh, and then she sees this vision of her, uh, you know, in the kaleidoscope of her husband, uh, you know, fucking, uh, Miyoki in, in her room and, and, and seeing him go into the room and having sex. Then she looks through the keyhole and she, she, again, it's all this kaleidoscope weird stuff, seeing him have sex, all this kind of stuff. Mixed in with she, some of the stuff where it looks like a glass that's warping and twisting the vision too. They, like when she looks through the keyhole, it switches to that, that warped vision stuff. Yeah. Uh, she, um, she then opens up the door and faints. Well, anyway, the husband wakes her up and everything looks normal and she yells at him that he's an animal and he's horrible and she, he's no good and he's cheating on her. And he tells her that he was upstairs and that she, he heard someone faint, so he came down and grabbed her. He says that she needs to go see a doctor, and she says she will never go see her psychiatrist. He tells her to go see a psychiatrist, and she says she'll never do that, and then he takes all her pills that she's been trying to use to sleep and says, then you don't need these anymore either, and he leaves. The next day, after the husband leaves, uh, she kind of sees him off. And as she goes, um, uh, Miyoki's putting these uh, potted plants up on the uh, 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 up on the deck so they can get some sun. And one falls on accident and falls, but almost hits the wife. Um, she apologizes, and the wife asks Miyoki uh, uh, to meet her inside. They go inside after she kind of yells at her and asks her about last night and her story. And her story matches the husband's perfectly. That she was asleep in her room, heard a thud, heard her husband like yelling for her to wake up, trying to pick her up. And she went, like, opened up her room door to see what was happening because she was scared. Um, and she's carrying the doll as she's telling the story. And the wife asks why she has to carry the damn doll. And she says the doll is for her protection, her mom always said. And then she starts laughing and giggling. Again, having like a very awkward fucking attitude towards this. So this girl is socially, but she, she should be socially inept. She was raised within what it sounds like a monastery with no other real people to be her friends. And may or may not be a cult, depending upon the way people react to the statue you photo that we heard earlier exactly you're you're very right yeah it seems kind of like it's a fringe belief type thing where it is the subject of ridicule from these scientists to even know anything about it so maybe yeah maybe and it sounds like her mother's a shaman she maybe not be was allowed to leave the place right um that could also be what made her and that, that could and that can stunt your growth. Yeah. <laughs> um, that night, she talks to her husband, and she wants to fire Miyoki. And her husband's just kind of exasperated. He goes, that's fine. You do whatever you want to do. Go ahead. Y you know, if it will make you feel better, go ahead and do it. And the way he kind of was just like, yeah, just let's go ahead. Let's fire her. All of a sudden, then she changes her mind. She goes, no one, I'm being crazy. And I'm not going to do this. And I'm not, and we're not going to fire her. And he goes, all right. So she goes, I'm going to go make some coffee. And she heads downstairs. And as she gets to like the stove, it's almost like the gas starts hitting. She's getting another vision and she falls to the ground. She's able to turn the gas off. And she then goes to the door and opens it up and fresh air starts, you know, coming in. She's like breathing it. She marches right in there and she accuses Miyoki. She goes, who are you trying to kill? Why are you leaving the gas on? And Miyoki says she thought she had turned it off. And when she showed her how to turn it off properly, she goes, oh, she goes, I didn't know that's how that worked. And then she's like, is, is gas dangerous to people? And she honestly didn't know it was harmful. I again, this is where we're seeing that this girl raised in this monastery or whatever it was, maybe not all that intelligent on regular things that we see. She is intelligent. She is just not educated in these things. That's that. There you go. That's the more appropriate way of saying that. I also want to point out, is this really what's happening? Is she really just that confused with this stuff? Or is this just her trying to play innocent to get away with the nefarious things that she's doing? How do we even really know? Yeah, um, I, uh, we don't. We don't know. You're right. I'm just saying, if you look at evidence... It very much appears she's just not educated. She's naive in these things. How about that? Naive is even a better word to use. It, uh, she's naive in this. It appears that she is uneducated on how these things work and is confused in some way, shape, or form on how their stove works with this and that the pot innocently fell off and that it wasn't intentional. However, so many of these things happening at once, you can't keep calling it an accident or a coincidence. True, but I mean, 
here's my deal. I I'm not exactly sure that this girl is 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 has the cognitive abilities to live uh, a, a, in the normal world right now. I think she's been very sheltered. I think either her mother or servants did everything for her, so she doesn't have these basic knowledges, and she maybe using even a little bit clumsy in how to work things. Or is she just trying to appear that way so that she can get away with her nefarious plan to off the woman and steal her husband that is that is a valid 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 suspicion i'm just going off the evidence i have at hand what the film is showing us does make you lean very much towards this bitch is crazy yeah yeah right um and that's the end of that 20 minutes by the way uh. so so the, we, we hop into the next 20 minutes we're really kind of on the go here um so the wife, um, she, she, uh, we start in the next morning minutes. The wife goes to her room and the husband comes in and she tells him that Miyoki is trying to kill her and she's very scared. And the husband is very concerned for the wife's mental health. Um, so the husband says he wants to call a psychiatrist, but she says, no, she begs him not to do it. Begs him. Not, not so much now the anger. Now she's almost in a plea to her husband to not do it. Um, she then talks to her friend and her friend also wants her to go see a doctor and her paranoia is high right now. She can barely even see her friend. She thinks her friend's laughing at her, um, which her friend's not. Her friend's is, is, is solidly concerned for her well-being. And she says in her mind, everyone thinks I'm crazy, but I'm not. But no one's thinking you're crazy. They just think you need help. Um, the next day we see, she goes up to their attic and she takes boards off this window that's up there. Um, and, uh, we then see, uh, Miyoki sleeping on the couch. The husband is going to wake her when the wife comes down. Uh, he, uh, the wife then wakes her up and the husband, I mean, again, this evidence, he sort of is annoyed that she's asleep on their couch. That's something she should do in her room. And he's like, you know, you need to get up and you need to do some work. Go make me some coffee. Um, and Miyoki asks if the wife would like some. She says yes. The Mo- Miyoki's, Miyoki's making the coffee, and the wife has this vision that she's opening up this powder and putting it in her coffee. She puts the coffee in front of the wife, and the wife thinks in her head. We hear her monologue saying, "If she thinks she'll, I'm gonna drink that. You know, like like I'll drink that. I'm not, you know, in a very sarcastic manner." Then she has visions of Miyoki dropping off coffee to the husband, and then Miyoki and the husband having sex. Um. Miyoki comes downstairs and the wife notices her top button is undone. And Miyoki says, oh, that when she was cleaning earlier in the day, it had torn off on a nail. The wife says, okay, I want you to uh, go upstairs and start cleaning some things like the window upstairs and all that. And Miyoki says, okay. And in her head, the wife's thinking in a monologue, she goes, you guys can have all your fun right now. Uh, but, you know, th- that's going to soon end. So Miyoki stacks some really riggedy kind of... Uh, 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 boxes or, or, you know, uh, almost like, uh, milk crates and stuff. Crates. Some really, really unbalanced crates together, uh, stacks them. And she gets on them and starts cleaning the window. The crates are moving, the windows budging. And as she keeps watching, uh, the doll is watching her as well. She brought the doll upstairs. She falls through the window to the ground and dies. As the husband and wife are checking her out, we see the doll falls in the ground freaking the wife out uh, and all a police officer comes by and the wife explains that she had always told Miyoki to be careful when cleaning that window upstairs because it moved and shook but she never listened so we see the wife set up and killed Miyoki so the cop leaves and the wife sees the doll and she throws it away like throws it down into some woods and shit like that later on in that night the daughter brings the doll back into the house saying look what I found and the wife freaks up and wraps it up all the while her husband's watching very much like wow she's like it's the look like you give when you're like oh, she is not well the wife then f- takes the doll and throws it in the lake that night she dreams that miyoki is dressed up at, like the doll with the sword she had chasing her and she catches her and then she wakes up and she goes for a walk and sees a dog with the doll and passes out and that ends at 20 minutes all right this is 
the point where you have to somewhat pick a side because the film's not going to answer the question by the end. All you're going to see are the repercussions of this main actress's actions when she decides to take Miyoki's life. Now, if this is not all in her head, which level of this is not an all in her head? Was her husband having an affair with a girl and did she have to take her out to make sure that she could remain in her husband's good graces? Was that really happening or was that in her head? And then did she really kill the girl? If the girl's really there at all and then now we see that she's actually dead this is a choice the wife made because one she thought this girl was trying to kill her or that Miyuki was trying to kill her to take her place whenever they found a way to do this you know third person in the house sex <laughs> retreat thing with the, the professor and Miyuki whatever's going on there you know and then now finally they're taking it to the next level where she's supposed to be gotten rid of or does the doll represent some type of way of getting what you want or you know like you give up a sacrifice to be able to get something that you want and so the husband was using it to get rid of his wife because that what he that's what he wants so he can cash it in for a younger model and then that's where Miyuki came from you know like is the husband the one that's actually using the doll in this point like you know is it like his thing that he is yeah. somehow summoned an evil spirit and Miyuki is the embodiment of that and is working for him is this a supernatural thing or is Miyuki actually the one that has the supernatural powers because of the shamanistic nature of her grandma who mysteriously died in a fire but the doll was fine you know or is it all just in the wife's head and there's just all these strange manic hallucinations that keep popping up you know an argument could be made very solidly at this point for any of these things but then the film takes this twist because Miyuki's now dead and we go in this completely different direction that says yeah so you thought that was confusing and you're not sure what was happening buckle up buddy yes i am under the firm belief the husband has no idea what's happening here like he he has not done anything inappropriate i believe this lady's having a nervous breakdown because of a busy husband who is putting his career right now before their marriage talking to a friend who filled her up and viewing herself as becoming older and she's not handling aging well even though she's only in her 30s but holy shit. And her friend said in the very beginning, 30s or 60s, doesn't matter. And, I mean, her friend really pumped her up. But I believe this woman is starting to have, she has some chemical balance in her life that somehow has been triggered. Maybe even she has past trauma that she's never dealt with. And somehow this doll has triggered it. But it was that slide of that doll has done her in. Maybe she has just had issues with not being able to sleep, like a really bad insomnia. Case of insomnia. And she hasn't been sleeping, so I've also had some really vivid fucking waking nightmares from insomnia too. Like you could you My God. You get some That's another good one. You get some really fucked up hallucinations from insomnia too. Well if she's truly not sleeping and she's wandering around the house in like this state on a constant basis, any of this stuff could be or could not be real. It could be her subconscious coming out. She could just be completely completely out of it from the insomnia and hallucinating and maybe maybe the pills she's taking are like fucking ambient right where sometimes people get up and walk around and have entire experiences that they just think were dreams but they yeah, are actually she's doing shit to, uh, i mean while taking these things that are supposed to help her sleep she's forcing herself to stay up somehow yeah or maybe they're just not working but at the same time they're heightening her lack of perception of reality of what is going on and just feeding into her paranoid delusions that she starts seeming to be having if you're going from that perspective and you know none of this is actually really happening but then things become so supernatural from this point forward that is it the consequences of her actions this is our new questions is this the consequence of her actions what we're seeing here or is this all in her head see what I'm saying that's the yeah. demarcation point of where we've changed the questions midway through the movie and you're like wait what all right, let's roll with it. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, things are just fucking insane. Right. But uh, I guarantee you when you're watching the film, you won't stop thinking about that shit. <laughs> exactly. And it's a fucking amazing. So now we go into our final 20 minutes. Her husband finds her and carries her inside. He tells her she is sick. And those dolls are all over the countryside right now. They're, they're a very popular item, apparently. And he goes, it's no problem. Then he puts the doll in the dresser and says that she must confront 
her uh, paranoia. That's the only way to defeat it. He says if he throws it, this doll away or removes it from this dresser, he'll be very angry. He then leaves for a four days for an uh, you, you know another a bit work trip, and he takes their daughter to her grandparents. The wife is at home alone. She calls for a friend to come over. Well, that night, a big storm rolls in. And the friend calls and says she can't make it because of the weather. And a friend of hers is coming over. So uh, then, as she's just kind of around the house alone, Miyoki's door the, flies open. And we see the reason for that is because the a window is left open. As she tries to close it, she sees the doll uh, and falls in the window. But she falls, but nothing's there. Um, the the wife uh, gets to her room, and she sees the doll, and she kind of turns it to face away from her. Then the power goes out because of the storm, and the doll starts turning on its own to face her, and then falls to the ground. Then all of a sudden, we see the big doll smashes the window. And at this point, the doll switches from looking like a just a giant, giant version version of that doll to Miyoki wearing the doll clothing and makeup. But it is chasing her throughout this whole throughout the house, smashing windows, smashing doors, the wife's throwing things at it to get it away from her, potted plants, everything. She's chased only for then the, the doll to disappear, only for it to come back and have more chasing around the house. And and then, like, the wife will throw things and then look around, and then she'll be alone in the house. But the house will be just trashed. The wife is able to get a knife, and she hears Miyoki and a man, probably her husband, laughing in the bathroom. She goes in to check, but no one's in there, of course. As she goes to leave, she's grabbed. And it's Miyoki. The wife is able to get on top of her and start stabbing her over and over again. Blood everywhere. All the while, Miyoki still laughs. As uh, then all of a sudden, she lays there and Miyoki dissipates. And now it's just a giant doll laying in the room. The wife gets up, staggered, falls to the floor, and passes out. We come a few days later and the husband comes back and he walks into the house to find it trash. As he look around, what he sees, he finds his wife, now done up like the statue, sitting, looking, staring straight into nothingness with the doll in front of her. The end. Roll credits. All right, so I'm going to lay out what I feel sort of that last 20 minutes represents, right? All right. There is the large version of the doll and then the Miyoki version of the doll that both show up and there are both pursuing her. Now, the question that I said earlier, was this all in her mind or is this really happening? Whenever the thoughts of certain things that may or may not have actually been really happening pop up, it's Miyuki attacking her because it's her husband's would-be lover that she got rid of that is her spirit is looking for revenge. But then because she murdered murdered Miyoki for no reason at all and it wasn't really there it's the doll that she is seeing just because that's just her generalized fear it's a symbol of her fear and the doll is there to protect Miyoki from her which means that it's coming back to protect Miyoki and it's also a symbol of the main character's fear so when we're jumping back and forth it's the maybe this was something that was really happening maybe it's this thing that's in her head even her having her doubts where is she being punished because Miyoki's spirit's back from the dead because this was all a mistake in all of my head and the dolls the symbolism of that or was she really trying to steal my husband and my life and replace me as the wife and is this doll attacking her because there really was a supernatural power and she really was trying to do all of that stuff and that's why it's Miyuki that, that shows up there because it's actually Miyuki getting revenge not just the idea or the symbol of it you know like that's how I was looking at it whenever the things were flipping back and forth and I kept thinking Jesus if that's what they meant that's really fucking deep <laughs> <laughs> but, right? but like they open up so many questions and there's so much symbolism there that like I'm sure they would be happy with this interpretation and tell me yes that's exactly what we meant and then tell everybody later on that that's what they meant and steal the idea from even if they didn't you know <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> which I suspect, by the way, a lot of these art filmmakers make, they just throw a bunch of shit at you. And then whatever someone makes up and they think it means, they go, yes, you got it, darling. And then they start copying to it. But what they really did was steal that original person's idea that they yeah, made that interpretation. Yeah. yeah, that's how I look at it, because most of these types of films don't move me in such a way to think about them that deeply. They're just people throwing shit on each other, the camera, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not that doesn't necessarily make it art. You know what I mean? That's true. That's true. But this film throws all this weird shit at you and all this strange symbolism and all of this stuff that you don't quite get. And I feel like it goes another layer deep after Miyuki dies and even is trying to be almost showing her, compl- if it isn't all in her head, it is her completely schizophrenic and destroyed mind coming to terms with what it is that she just did, the repercussions of her actions of the murder that she just caused. And part of her is trying to tell her it was all in her head and she killed her for nothing. The other part of her is telling her that she did kill her for a specific reason because she was trying to steal the husband. And it's just this back and forth trying to figure it out. But at the same time, the guilt is crushing her when she's having all of these hallucinations. And the result of all of this, regardless of what it is, is either a possession because this has been happening the entire time and Miyuki's spirit has gotten revenge and taken over her body and now she's a living doll like this thing, you know, that we saw at the very end. Or the other one is it's all in her head and her mind is so severely broken now that she is literally thinking that she is this doll and she may never come back from this state. She became what she feared the most to try to appease it. Yeah, something along those lines. Like, like it's one of those two things, but is this the repercussions of her actions, or is this all in her head? You know, is it a curse that's the repercussions think, of her actions, or is it all in her head? My opinion, it's one of two things. It was one thing until you mentioned something, and now, for me, it's one of two things. It's one, she has a, a, a bad case of PTSD, something has happened in her past. And then seeing that doll triggered that. Now, who knows if that doll, that particular doll, was even a part of it. Maybe that cult tried to get her when she was a kid. Who knows? Maybe it had nothing to do with the doll. Just the doll reminded her of something. But that's when everything was triggered. I, you know, There was nothing untoward happening. Everything was happening inside her head. Or it's until the point where she became so feared that the only thing she felt that she could do was become the thing that made her that scared to appease it. Or, and now she's retreated so far into her mind, you'll never get her out. Or two, she started having trouble sleeping. She was taking heavy medications to try to help her sleep. She still wasn't sleeping. And that and the, that idea you just said is sitting in my mind that inversely affected her. And she was already probably tired when she saw that picture of the doll. And for some reason, because that unsettled her even just a little bit, it probably jumped up a hundred times in her mind. Um, We know the reason why the picture of the doll is in there now is because he was in a part of the country where uh, a lot of those dolls show up because a lot of the people believe in that. And, you know, the rest just happened from there. But I, both of those things entail... All this happened into her head. She trashed the house herself. She made up an affair in her head. Um, And then when everything she tried to do wouldn't work, she just became the doll. Notice how the kid really disappears very quickly during the movie and no longer becomes a subject of where where, where was the kid? What what happened with the kid? Yeah, Yeah, right. Do they even have a kid? They do have a kid. And he took her. But the kid's at the grandma's. Right. Okay. But do they? Well, I mean, the husband was seen talking to the daughter. Was he? Did we ever see the husband outside of the perspective of where the wife's viewing him with the daughter? The husband does talk about the daughter. With the wife or to other people without the wife there? Holy shit, yeah. Maybe they lost a child. Maybe she's no longer fertile because she's getting older, or that's part of her fear, and the young person represents replacing her. Maybe that little girl represents her lost daughter that comes to visit them with the statue that's protecting her. Maybe all of this is in her mind, and because she's left alone to stew in her own loneliness when her husband's gone, and she doesn't even have a daughter, and maybe she doesn't even have a helper, maybe all of it's in her head. Maybe every single piece of this is just this vivid hallucination, and it came to a point in her loneliness with the fear of the doll when the husband was trying to have her confront it to where her mind completely broke could be too i but again 
all of it front, uh, fronts into the fact that all of this was in her head. I don't believe it was supernatural as well. And I don't even, yeah. I don't, the thing is, is I don't even know how much of it actually is in her head. That's the part that was keeping me up, like was trying to figure out what of it might actually be real. And the more I dug into thinking about what is, you know, what is real, what is not. Then I was like, well, wait, was the husband really around with a child? Like everything that I just said to you was stuff that was going through my head where I'm like, can I remember that? And I was trying to play it back in my head and thinking about it, which prompts you to really be able to enjoy multiple rewatches of this to look for tiny little details if you wanted to which i feel makes the film that much more enjoyable so fuck this is a really good fucking movie man it's a really great movie it's a really great movie and like i said we i stayed up the uh, the whole time i'm like well this is this is definitely uh, this is definitely all in her head but how it happened and then like you said last night i was sitting there waking up and go oh man maybe she has ptsd Maybe something happened in her past that just affected her so bad. And then seeing that doll for some reason just spiked it in her and she lost it from there. And then add in heavy medications she's trying to take to try to sleep, all that kind of stuff. I was like, yeah, that's that, that's got to be what's happening to her. Honestly, the insomnia angle until we started reviewing the film together and talking about it didn't really pop into my head. So really? Yeah. And that's why I said, well, maybe she has insomnia because they talk about how she can't sleep. And I know insomnia causes hallucinations if you go long enough. I know that personally that happens. (laughs) 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 You have waking nightmares and all sorts of other weird things and like you lose time. And the kind of thing that we're seeing in the film is stuff that does happen to you, including your vision getting all weird, you know, so maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's insomnia in induced hallucinations and then her mind just went too far you know like maybe the drugs made that that much worse i'm more of the opinion that it is all in her head as well i just the the minutia that i would go for is at what point do we know for sure that it's in her head like and where 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 is the reality do we have a baseline of reality in this film at all? And I would argue that we do not. I think all of this is one giant hallucination brought about by a diseased mind. And it's uncomfortable to watch from that perspective because you don't know what's going on. And the film does a really good job of making you feel disoriented and confused, but at the same time, giving you enough fragments to ascertain what may be going on and try and make a a valid decision on that. I will say this, regardless of what she thought was happening, trying to kill the girl off to save herself in any way, shape, or form that she was doing doesn't seem like the right decision to me. No, that seems very, yeah, not a good decision. And that's not the sort of way that a person with a sane mind would handle it, no matter how frazzled they are. She should have just tried to make the girl leave. You know, like, like she should have just found a way to demand the husband get rid of her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, something. I totally agree. She but, should have fired him when she had the chance. Right. But like, what if the girl's really not there? You know, then all this, oh, yeah. the, that's maybe that's why maybe she that's can't why he's so exasperated. Her. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like what, what is, what is all of this going on? What, what, where, you know, and that's yeah. tonight's the first time that I was like, well, maybe the child was never even there, but I didn't question if the child was there, but I'm thinking to myself, Jesus fucking Christ is the, you know, <laughs> that's you know, crazy. Yeah. And the more we're talking about it, the more you roll it around in your head, these types of thoughts are what are going to keep you up trying to think about it even further, which makes it infinitely more enjoyable to watch it again. I'm pretty yeah. sure that no matter how many times you watch it, you're not going to get it fully figured out in your own head. And and yeah, and you really don't get bothered by the the closed caption. It really or the 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 subtitles. You really get through that just fine. Yeah. Um, just to give a little bit of review of the actual transfer as well, I like to try and do that. This is a Mondo Macabro Blu-ray that I got my hands on. Uh, the transfer is gorgeous. It looks incredible. And one of the things that I love that they definitely don't do is they don't go in and do that noise reduction shit to try and get rid of film grain. It looks like scanned in film and it looks what I would assume is as close as to what the filmmakers intended it to look as possible. Yeah. Pure and simple. It's a beautiful fucking Blu-ray. It's a really wonderful presentation of the film the subtitles like you said are not that egregious because while there is dialogue it's easy to follow and they set the pacing of it very very well and i cannot believe this film was made in 1981 just after censorship laws were loosened that makes it so perfect for this show on so many levels yes it does (laughs) oh boy yeah i had such a 
a, a great time watching this film. You really get into it. Yeah, so much so that we blew past what we would actually be able to do for PSYOP News for the night because we're both up way later even tonight talking about it than what we intended. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take our final break here. We'll play the Ending Legion promo. We'll have a little bit of music that is synthwave and fits with the idea of the 80s because that's the film's yeah. uh, decade of origin. When we come back, we will close out this babbling fucking show. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. John Carpenter, didn't it? Right. Yeah, big time. <laughs> yeah. Well, we you got to wrap up the show, so let's uh, let's do this because I'm still confused as to whether or not what I was seeing in the film was actually happening or a hallucination it's- of a deranged mind. Is this actually happening? No, we're definitely recording this. I know that okay. because it will be released to the internet and we will have evidence that this recording took place. Is the internet even real? Well, that I don't know, Neo, but uh, you should probably take the blue pill. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you would like to find other instances where I may have referenced the Matrix in such a way, which I don't think it exists, but all previous 273 episodes are available on our Legion Podcast landing and launching site, legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. That's where you're going to find all 273 previous episodes. And if there are or are not incidents of me mentioning the Matrix, I don't believe I ever did until now, right? I think it's the first Matrix you've ever, yeah. Yeah, well, we're questioning reality, and well, you know, that's the most prevalent one people think about when they question reality. Yeah, yeah, it's always, yeah, yeah, the. <laughs> or at least the modern, the young kids. The, the, the young, those youngsters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they never, they never know about lawnmower man. Oh Christ! Fuck that movie. That's a piece of shit. <laughs> <It's> all right. <laughs> all right. So, if you would like to find other instances where we discuss films, or maybe have alternative photography memes that make you question your own personal reality, you can check out our Facebook group, Cinema Psyops. I'm also available on Facebook as Court Psyops, and Matt is also available as Matt. 
Matt Zayat. By available, I mean he occasionally shows up there while we were recording and post stuff. Sometimes he even posts memes in the group over himself. The weekend, I was very over last week. I was active with the memes. Yeah, I, it was nice to actually see you in there. It was a pleasant yeah. surprise. Still, I'm not. I'm not giving any up any of my Among Us hardcore porn. <laughs> so stop asking people. It's mine. Go find your own. If you would like to ask Matt for that hardcore porn about Among Us, you can email him, psyopmatt at gmail.com. If you would like to email feedback to court to recommend he check out certain hardcore porn, that is cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. <laughs> you can also tweet a couple of tweets on the hate-filled shit fest that at least allows porn stars to just be themselves. That is Twitter. I'm at court underscore psyop, and he is at psyopmatt. We're also available on the gram of Insta. That is... Instagram. I am cinema underscore psyops on the gram of Insta. Yeah, all them Instagrams, all them peoples on Instagrams. <laughs> well, while you're out there questioning your own realities, trying to figure out whether or not you're being replaced, or perhaps if something is just not quite right and everyone is out to get you, just remember kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch. Let's go off by what most. Did I just lose doing? you? Yeah, I just no, lost you. I'm Fuck. Here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Fuck. Yeah, it's weird. Nothing dropped on my end. Yeah, I don't know what happened. It just happened. Okay. Right. So I made the joke about edging us more than yeah, any. I heard it all the way. I could hear you and you just couldn't hear me. Oh, okay. Foreign made film. Uh, I think it's, is it Indonesia? I think it was, what, what is made in? Did that sound right? No, I thought it was South Korea. Was it a South Korean film? I thought, I thought it was a Korean film. Or I, mean, I thought it was a Korean film, but I'm not entirely sure. This is riveting fucking radio. No, yeah, it's South Korea. <laughs> You're right. All right. Yeah, okay. Um, I, uh, let's see here. Sorry, I just got completely lost. My fault. Did it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, hold on. I had a point, and now it's just gone. And not the top of my head either, folks. You know, bad omens there. Always listen to your wife on occasion. I'm just saying. You know, it might help you out. <clears throat> Unless she's telling you to stop doing drugs and or drinking, Matt Psyop says, always listen to your wife. Yeah, okay, these are true. These are true. Why, why, I mean, why, why do you got to be like that? <laughs> what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> uh, all uppercase word facts at the end of this post. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. And, um... Sorry, I hit a key. Oh, okay, not a problem. The, uh, the, the, fuck. Hold on. Sorry. I can't even read my own handwriting sometimes. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Three, two, one. So, um, let's see here. Hey, man, can you give me one second? Actually, I need to grab a drink, so, um, I'll come awesome. back and check with Great. you on that. Is that cool? Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm going to run and grab a drink, too, while I'm checking this. Cool. Thanks. I'm back. I'm back if you're here. Yeah. You know, not to make 15-year-old me blush, but I do open mouth kiss a girl. So, um... <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> God, I wish I could just include this stuff. Jeez. Stop doing gold about fucking shit we shouldn't be putting on the show. <laughs> And I have stopped recording. Cool. That went way longer than I was intending, but we're talking about a movie we both fucking loved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it went longer, but I, I think we're going to get a good show out of that. Yeah, yeah. Once it's all edited down and the dead space is taken out, it probably won't even be that long, but we were at this for a long time. So yeah. you have a good night.